How do we bring to life that braveness? How do we bring to life that courage in a working environment? Now, to take us through that, we've got a conversation with two wonderful people. Um, I would like to introduce them up to the stage. Our first person is Gemma Greaves, the CEO of the Marketing Society. Yes. And our second speaker is Ellie Norman, Director, Global Director of Marketing and Comms for Formula One. Yes, let's welcome them to the stage. Woo. <laughs> Good luck, guys. <laughs> Do we need luck? Yeah. We just need bravery. <laughs> sure. Oh, brilliant. Oh, I bought my own just in case. <laughs> Always prepared. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeremy. This is such a great, great event. And I have to say, I'm loving the fact that um, we're on a catwalk. Last year I wore heels and I, was just, I, I just couldn't this year. So Trainers are the way forward, Jen. You taught me that, Elliot. You taught me a lot. <laughs> um, so picking up on the brave theme and something that we care so much about. Um, and we live yeah. through that lens, both of us. Why do you think being braver is so critical to our industry? I think when I look at our industry, it's often, I think from a client side, it's really easy for clients or brands actually to, to be in inertia. And everything around us is changing so, so quickly that you have to be brave to break that inertia. And you can just sort of pick some categories where They've completely lost out because they haven't broken that inertia. Um, Kodak versus sort of an Instagram or hotels with Airbnb, taxis and Uber. There are so many different examples where inertia ends up killing stuff. And so that bravery is required to break that inertia. And I think, often I think about, well, what is the worst that can happen? To Jazzy's point, we are essentially in sort of PR. It's, it's marketing. We're not in ER. There's very little that I will do that is going to save a life. And so what is the worst that can happen? And I remember you saying that before to me. What's the worst that can happen? What are your two things? Will it kill me or can it make me pregnant? And if the <laughs> answer to those is like, no, today is going to be a good day. <laughs> I love that. So um, break the inertia, be brave, because I think actually it's when you step into being uncomfortable, you're going to stretch yourself, you're going to learn some new things, and often it's at that place of dis disruption where um, the magic happens. Yeah. And how do you think... But what advice would you give to that? Because you, I think, are in a really unique position where you actually get to see examples across all different verticals and um, sort of horizontal, sort of different industries, levels, everything else. So I, um, I think that it, it comes down to us as individuals. So what Jazz talked about, you know, as, us as humans. Um, as marketeers, mm. we need to find a way to tap into the humanity mm. because that's when as everyone knows, we can have a connection with our customers. And the way to do that is we've got to be brave, we've got to go outside our comfort zone. You know, why, why, um, why be the status quo? We've yeah. got to you know, push things. So last year we were on stage um, with Mitch from Mars, and she said, if we're not brave, we become obsolete. Mm. And they've obviously done some incredible work. Yeah. And I think what we need to do is, and we were talking about this before, we need to find a way to create in a, within our company culture, the ability for people to feel they can go outside their yeah. comfort zone. And the reality is, a lot of corporates are set up to be risk adverse. Yeah. And they're very happy with a, a great, um, a good friend of mine, Andy Fennell, uh, that taught me this thing that was absolutely brilliant. He was a CMO of Diageo um, um, you know, a few years ago before Sil. Sil Salah, our president, she's also an epic human being. Um, he said to me, most companies, are happy with a seven, but I'm not happy with a seven, I want a 10. But in order to get a 10, I've got to accept I'm gonna get some threes mm. along the way. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to encourage yeah. people to be able to bring their best mm. self forward. And the only way you can do that, as Jazz said, is, is to show that, that vulnerable side. Mm. Does that mean? Yeah. So, so what, what, what do you think, um, what's, your, what's the single trait you admire in a leader? So there are definitely a number of different tra traits, but I think some of the things that I really do admire is um, sort of resilience, because I think you 100% have to be resilient. If you're going to be brave and you're going to kind of break some stuff along the way, you're going to also have to pick yourself back up, and you will have successes, and there'll be some things that aren't successful. And it's your ability to get up quickly 
and to kind of keep moving forwards. And I think it's so easy that if you've had a fall, you don't want to put yourself out there so much again. But that's when I do think that that sense of fear starts to kind of set in. Unless you sort of go back to those same levels of bravery, actually the speed at which you change is going to slow down. Or at worst, no change is going to happen. And you, I, for me, I think you look at a lot of big corporations, and it's a fear that we've become so successful that we're almost scared to make the changes in case we lose that. And, and often what does set in is inertia. And then everything around you changes so much, and you do become obsolete. So resilience for me. I like that a lot. And tell us a time when, so you haven't let inertia set in at Formula One. You've made some, some big changes. Yeah. I'd like so to think I uh, move quickly, not quite at 230 miles an hour, but we're getting there. <laughs> I think sometimes you do. Um, tell us what, what you've been doing, um, where you've been breaking outside that comfort zone and doing things differently. Yeah, so first thing was, um, actually there was, there'd never actually been a marketing function. So going into what was essentially like an old boys club, as <laughs> um, not a boy, um, <laughs> with no department and nothing, but I did get a mobile phone and a laptop, um, and an office with a nice view, so good, good things. But to start from scratch and then to be brave enough that you, you look at the business and you say there's some fantastic things about this business. It's 68 years old. Um, you've got half a billion fans across the world. Those are like, they're, they're wins for me. They're good ticks. Um, but it's an old boys club and it's got some really bad perceptions and associations with the sport. And that's not just like make a little change and color in sort of the edges. That is, you need to kind of break that. And so I think the very, very quickly was I need to rebrand this sport. Um, and so actually doing a rebrand and a new logo, defining what the culture should be and starting that internally as to how do we show up outside was really, really big. And when people are on social media, it's really easy to be mean and horrible and personal so because it's invisible. So and um, rebranding the sport, I did attract a lot of negativity and some really personal kind of mean stuff. And I had to turn that off for a few days and just go home and think that it's our time. It's our time to be relevant in society, and it's our time to make a difference. And I'm more comfortable with change than other people, but I think unless you, you start to make that change become normal, um, you're not going to do anything. And it will take people time to be comfortable with change. And now no one talks about it. But at the time, it was, yeah, it was, it was quite a big thing to do. And just picking up on something you said there, um about the social media and mm. invisible. So it's very easy when things are anonymous yeah. um, to, be, to be cool and to be mean. How do you, you mentioned that you, how did you deal with that? Especially when it's personal, because yeah. that's, that's It's a big horrible deal. when it's personal because you get up every day and I'm driven by making a difference and seeing myself almost as a caretaker. So the sport will live and I'm a caretaker and my job is to make it better and to pass it on to the next generation. Uh, and when it's personal, the last thing you, wanna, you want to be is thinking, am I good enough to be doing this job? Am I the right person? Do I get it? What am I actually adding if you're getting this sort of abuse on social media? Um, but to go home and, and have, as I say, a husband that does a real job. Um, <laughs> he works in complex abuse and serious organized crime. So, you know, often our dinner table conversation for me is in this bubble of it's not really a real world versus a very real world where he's making an incredible difference. And so it keeps everything kind of balanced and measured. So if, if people are making gifts about me being a piece of shit on their shoe because I've changed the logo, so what? You're reminding me of the brilliant Roosevelt quote. Um, it's not the critic who counts. It's the man or woman in the arena who's yeah. prepared to be bloody and mild. Yeah. But have you felt that from when you took on the position of chief exec at the marketing society? Have you sort of felt, because for me as a member, I sort of see the sort of 
absolute kind of change, but you've sort of flipped that on its head. So how, how have you felt going through that sort of process from something, I'm going to make this up, is it 50 years old, 60 years old? 60. 60. 60. I haven't been there for 60 years, though, I might You're looking good on it. <laughs> um, gosh, it's been really hard. It's been really hard because um, we're a membership community, so we need to take our members with us mm. wherever, wherever we go. And everyone's got different opinions. And I'm not... You know, I'm very aware that um, I took over from a brilliant man, Hugh Burkett, who we're very different. He's very corporate, he's very polished, he's a wee bit older than me, a wee bit greyer. He wouldn't mind me saying, hopefully. Um, and he's what you would expect the mm. chief executive of the Marketing Society to look like, not like, like me. So I felt this real sense of, I can't do it. Like the, uh, you know, mm. at the beginning, I, I knew, when I was asked to do the job and when I went through all the interview process, I was like, yes, I can do it and I'm ready. And then the idea of having to step into his shoes was so intimidating. And what I decided is if I'm going to do it, um, and it was through being around amazing people like you um, uh, and Jeremy, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to, I'm going to do it my way. And that means... There's a song in there, Jim. There is a song in there. Should we sing it? I feel like we should be singing with these funny microphones. Um, but I'm not the best singer and I'm losing my voice as well. Um, but you could sing. No. <laughs> And the first step of doing that, I realised, was being brave. Mm. And the first step of being brave is to be able to be yourself and to be your true self. Mm. And that's not easy. And it's no. not easy in a public way when everyone's got an opinion. Yeah. It's hard. But the only way you'll achieve greatness is if you go for it. And I firmly believe that. Yeah. So what's the, what's the defining moment in your career? I would say... On my journey to date, it would be getting rid of grid girls from uh, Formula One. Yes. And um, it seems like a small thing to do of like, why wouldn't you do that? Um, and when I, when I got a phone call to come and meet Sean, my um, sort of boss, he's our um, chief operating officer, um, and I had a coffee with him, and he, the first thing he said to me is, uh, what do you think we should do? And I said, I think we've just got to get rid of them. And diversity and inclusion is so, so important, but we as a sport have this enormous global platform. Um, we're on TV in like 200 countries. You've got 490 pe million people that kind of watch every race. I mean, it's like big numbers. So why are we only showing women in one way? Mm. Um, because if we are, again, to inspire the next generation to be whatever they want to be, they need to see balance and they need to see women doing different roles and so um, again it was a lot of abuse from those sort of hardcore sort of fans as to you're taking away the choice from um, these women that's what they've chosen to do um, and so if I really I do respect that opinion because that's that's one thought but when I was sitting on my side of the table it's like well what are they actually doing because on telly the viewers know like where the cars are. The cars are actually pushed onto the track um, by the pit crew, and their pit crew of like they're all in their team colours and uniforms. And the drivers, I guarantee you, know what car they're driving in that day. So there's no purpose to these ladies holding a stick with a number on. So if we get rid of those, actually, it does give us the ability just to hold up a different mirror as to what is possible for young girls and young, uh, young people in this sport. And now it's our opportunity to shine the spotlight on um, incredible strategists, ladies that are in pit crews, um, working as team principals, like in every single area of the sport, there are really incredible women. And if, if that can be something that I can leave as a legacy of just starting the change into essentially allowing young girls to think that there is a role for them in Formula One in whatever area they choose, then that's a sort of fantastic thing. So alongside that, we have a education program which is called F1 in Schools. And you kind of speak to people now and it's like, what do you want to do? And it could be, I want to go and work at kind of Google or Facebook or Apple or Amazon or kind of Disney. But actually, we are 100% the sexiest place to do STEM. So um, through this education process, we have sort of a million kids come through a year. And um, it's fantastic to see that there are 44% of girls that are coming through and this program essentially allows them to design and create their own miniature F1 cars, race them, 
fundraise, get the sponsorship, and sort of sell it. So that for me is if I can continue to grow that, then that's a brilliant thing that you have an entire new generation coming through that is going to think about Formula One different, and we can be relevant into the benefit that we bring to society. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. I was just thinking... So touching on diversity and equality, and, and a question that I always get asked, um, which um, I always find, find an interesting question to be asked, is, you know, as a, as a female, mm. do you feel like you've ever been held back in your career? To you? Do you know what? Honestly, I don't. So I've no. worked in... Actually, I left school at 18, and I thought I'd better get a job. And I've been... Lucky that every job I've gone to, I've had sort of advocates. And I use the word advocate because an advocate for me in each of my jobs has very much been someone that's been in a senior position, but they've seen something in me, which um, I think is because I don't have an education, I'm sort of trying harder to make a difference or to sort of show my worth. And actually they've kind of propelled me into situations or to stretching myself. Um, where, you know, jump in and it's kind of sink or swim. But to have an advocate that you know is looking out for you has been so incredibly helpful. And so even though I've worked in predominantly male-dominated environments, I started after a, I did five years agency, and then I went to automotive and then into sort of um, Virgin Media. So again, TV broadcast entertainment mm. can be sort of quite male and now sort of Formula One. But I've never found or thought that I've been sort of held back. And I think it comes from having always had these advocates that allow me to be myself, actually. And to get taking you back to when you were 18, did you think you'd end up where you are now? No, when I was 18, I was like, oh my god, I better get a job. And um, I've always had a innate something inside me, which is I hate following the norm or being told what to do. And it's true. That is very true. That is very true. <laughs> and I, that really just kind of grates me. So you go to school and there is an expectation that you're going to follow this set path. And um, I was head girl in my school, and so I thought, well, of course. If, if they're going to tell me I'm going to go to university, I'm going to be like, no, I'm not even going to fill out my UCAS form. So, but then when you are in that sort of environment of like, wow, I've actually got to get a job, you've got to pay rent. Um, and I just think about it as like one step in front. So you get a job and I was like, oh, I think I'd love to be, a, I'd be happy being an account manager. So I never, ever did I think that I would be now doing what I'm doing. And if you could go back and if there's one thing that you know now that you wish you'd have known then, what would it be? The importance of being bold being different, and um, get comfortable very, very quickly with being uncomfortable. I love that. Do you, I mean, you're very much, I think, with your sort of brave agenda that you've put into the marketing society, that's a big sort of aspect of, I think, what you're sort of doing is that sort of uncomfortableness. Yeah. What else would you add to that? So we love creating uncomfortable, sorry, comfortable spaces to have uncomfortable conversations because it allows, it allows us to tap into the things that actually really matter. So, um, you know, we, we talk about mental health, age, neurodiversity, race, things that um, are often hidden um, that we need to be talking about because it's only when we do that together that we can start mm. to make, make and, 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 solve, um, and solve things together. And I think that's really important. But what would I add? What I wish I would have known? Um, I wish I'd have known it's okay to be yourself mm -hmm. and to be your true self and to be able to bring that into everything that you do and not have to be a, a version of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think the second thing is it's okay not to be okay. Ruby Wax said that at one of my events um, a couple of years ago and I thought it was absolutely brilliant because most of us you know, think we have to bring a different yeah. a version and actually we don't. We all, we all have mental health, mm. we all have physical health. It's not one in four, it's, it's all of us. Mm. And it's how we, how we handle it. And the more we're able to talk about that stuff together, the more we can help each other. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Very, very cathartic conversation. So one of the things we did do, um, I did do last week, is I hosted um, a session at a uh, wonderful lady, Ali Hannan's uh, event, Creative Equals, on imposter syndrome. 
Um, everyone know what imposter syndrome is? Yeah. You were there, so you definitely know. Um, imposter syndrome, you know, the fear that we're going to be found out and that we actually got to where we got to because of luck, not our abilities. Do you think, and, 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 and one of the things that, that we, you know, um, realized from doing this session is, is it's universal. Most of us, mm. most of us feel like it. Do you, do you think you, well, I know you do. What, what's, where's your imposter syndrome? So my, um, my imposter syndrome does come back to the fact that I don't have any qualifications. And I should have a big enough jar of facts and evidence that says, actually, I, I've been not in this role clearly for 20 years, but I've been within marketing for 20 years. And um, it doesn't matter that I don't have a piece of paper that says I've got this, this, and this. But often when, um, when you're in situations, and the most amazing thing at Formula One is you are often in situations with people that you would never be imagine being in a situation with. And that goes from governments and prime ministers, some nicer than others. <laughs> um, Do you <want> to share? <laughs> meeting Putin was slightly scary. <laughs> um, down to, and I still wore trainers that day. Um, <laughs> down to just incredible people like Nikki Lauda, who we sadly passed away yesterday. Mm. Um, and when you are around people with such life experiences, education and everything, I often think, should I be here? Or how have I actually got here? Or, wow, I've just had like lady luck on my side. Um, and it's reminding yourself as to, well, what are all of these sort of proof points or your kind of jar of facts and evidence that says, no, you do have a right to be here and actually, you think about the positive of you are coming at it with a different perspective, and there's nothing for me that's more important than having different points of view around a table, different people, and people from having had different life experiences, because that's gonna get us to a better solution, a better answer, and a better way of doing things. Um, but when you're in the moment, it's really, really hard to think about your um, jar that's evidence and facts, and the positive side of that. The two pots, facts and feelings. Exactly, that's that. what you taught me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so what advice would you give to marketers, or, or, or just, 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 just generally, you know, business leaders, as, um, how you bounce back? So my, it took me a little while to, to kind of figure this out, but my bounce back is um, my own space, and. The older I get, the more I really value my space, and to the point that I will do a 90-minute commute each way because the importance of me being surrounded by fields and trees and being able to walk outside in bare feet is so important, and that's my sort of source of energy and my bounce back, um, along with actually just sort of exercise. Give me shed. what shed. my shed. Yeah. yeah. So I will always say to Jem because Jem's always trying to get me to have one more drink at the bar, and I'm like, no, Jem, it's all about the shed. <laughs> and the shed is sleep, hydration, exercise, and diet. Um, and at the end of the season, normally the diet slipped a bit because I've eaten my way around 21 time zones, but I'm trying to be good this year, so we'll see how that goes. I love that. I'm just going to see if anyone's got any questions. Well, I've got, got one left for you, actually. Oh, absolutely. Um, but let's do that in a second. <laughs> any, <laughs> any questions from our lovely audience? Yes, we've got one there. Yeah. Say who you are when you ask questions. Uh, who I am? My yeah, name, no? Yeah. Yeah, Coca from Perfect. TITS. Uh, nice yeah, I'm dying to ask this question from the start of, the, of this chat. Uh, part of the rebranding, the, the documentary that was launched on Netflix. Netflix, yeah. It's part of the new branding? So it's part of, it's part of the new way of us marketing the sport. So, so you're responsible for, for, for that? Um, as a, there's a team of us internally, yeah. but in terms of us as a team, working with Netflix to, pr to do the documentary series, yes. So I just want to congratulate you because uh, I, was, uh, I lived in Brazil for many years. After Ayrton Senna uh, yep. died, I disconnect from sports. 
and this documentary is the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm falling in love again with Formula One. So it's... Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, it's really thank amazing. You. There's so a nice. second series coming and um, actually linked to this sort of bravery thing. The hardest thing is to, um, to hand over everything to sort of Netflix. So we said we don't want any editorial input um, because we're experts at racing on track. You're experts at telling stories, and, and that's love quite that. a brave decision to make yeah. for, as well. It's a brilliant decision. Love that. Love that. Any other? Oh, we've got a question here. Hi there. My name is Agatha. Um, you transformed a very male-dominated sport, as you said. How do we get women more into sport, both as an exercise, but also in media and to watch and, and mm. engage with something that's so much fun and creates a community? That is a great question. Mm. I don't think we've, there's one silver bullet to that, but one thing I really do believe in is the, certainly from um, sort of research or the sort of understanding that we have, is the change happens particularly in girls between the ages of eight to 12. And um, it's where I think they become, start to become more self-aware of am I gonna look silly? Will I be really red-faced and sweaty? And um, can I do this? Or you know, are they going to be better than me? And for me, it's about starting programs that encourage girls to keep trying at that age. Um, and that's really, really important, I think, at that young age, so you get them into kind of grassroots. And then sort of more broadly, I think, um, I'm. I absolutely love what um, Women's Sport Trust is doing. And actually, you know, you start to see now so many women's sports leagues selling out. And it is an incredible atmosphere. It's family friendly. And I think that there's a lot of sort of macho-ness that's been taken out. And quite often, women's sport is really, really competitive. Um, and actually, the quality of it can be sort of far better. Um, so I think it's just trying to look at all of the sort of different layers as to where there are barriers and just starting to kind of really focus on what are the changes that you can make across that spectrum to sort of do that. We are a little bit different in that we have made a conscious decision not to have um, a sort of women's only series and that's for us because since we were born as a sport in 1950, women can race alongside men. So for us, it's about creating an environment where there's more of a path for women to come up into Formula One, but they should be racing against kind of men. There is the sort of apparatus there like you'd have in equestrian or kind of sailing, where physically they can compete alongside men. Nice, nice. And I think we're beginning to run out of time. Um, so, uh, you want to ask me a question? I've got another one for you as well. I'm going to go first. <laughs> go on. Because I want to know, after um, Jazz spoke earlier, I want to know, Jem, what's next for you and what's your swag? I love that. Wow. Um, by the way, I thought Jazz was amazing. I love her. Um, what's next? So for me, it's through having these big and brave and important conversations about things that matter, that together unite the industry. And together we can start to make some change. So right now, um, my focus, or the Marketing Society focus, is on how, I, I believe that as marketers, we don't just have a responsibility. No, we don't just have an opportunity, we have a responsibility with the, the things that we have in terms of our skills as marketers, influence, persuasion, etc. but also the assets that we've got, the, the, um, the, the brands. Mm. We have to use that to make a difference, to the better, and for me, my big audacious goal, I, I can't remember the exact acronym, I'm not very good with acronyms, as many of you know that know me, um, is particularly around the area of disability. So a lady, whoever was here last year, um, uh, was the, the first speaker last year, um, had a huge imp impact on me, a lady called Caroline Casey, um, and she's behind Valuable 500. It's the way that brands and leaders think about disability. And last week I was on stage with her and Paul Polman, the outgoing chief executive of Unilever, where they're committed to getting 500 chief executives to get behind their um, movement. And Fantastic. for me, 
that's what's next. It's, and that's what I'm most excited about is how as marketers we can get behind that influence the top people in the business to make some change and ensure that, you know, we, there is equality across the board. And I think that's so important. Yeah. Nice. Um, what's next for you? What's, what, what's, what are you looking forward to most this year? And I think we then um, are out of time. Second of December, season's finished. I get to be at home. Um, but no, seriously, this year we, um, we announce the, the next chapter of our sport. So we have a rule change in 2021. Um, and this is about bringing accessibility and competitive racing. Um, and it sounds really, really simple, but when you are changing the foundations and the commercial model and structure of an entire sport, it's pretty huge. But that for me is incredibly exciting. And off the back of that, actually how we can take technology out into benefiting um, society and sustainability. Love it. I have to say, based on uh, the theme of the day and uh, Jazz saying people that have had an impact on you, you've had an impact on me. And um, I think you're inspirational and I'm sure the rest of the audience agree. Thank you, Jen. So thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellie and Gemma. Let's hear it for them. Whoa. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.